Yo, yo, it's the Life is Dope Podcast. I'm your man, Graffiti. What's good, ladies and gentlemen? It is Davey. How you doing, bro? Hey, I feel great. How about yourself? Hey, man, I'm chilling, man. I'm, I'm, I'm on a cloud right now. It's a good day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good day. What's going on in the world, brother? What kind of cloud is that? Um, just high on life, you know? <laughs> life is dope, bro. Uh, it's a lot of shit going on, man. It's, uh, where do we start? Where do we start? Um, uh, iPhone X users making bank by reselling device on eBay. Hmm. Oh, you got the X, too. How much are they reselling for? I don't know. Probably something stupid. Let me see. Let me open the article instead of just reading the headline. Yeah. Uh, starting at nine ninety nine. That's not bad. Uh, oh, 2000 2400 Okay. That's Wait, a flip. Talk, start talking? Yeah, yeah. Talk <laughs> in, 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 in. I have a question about this. First, yeah. my name is Moose. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Damn. I, I, thought we was Straight on iPhones. I thought we was on iPhone 8. Yeah. Now we're, we just skipped 9 and went straight to 10. Yeah. Well, they're not calling it 10. They're calling it X. X. Even though it's 10. Even though it's 10. Then but if you think Roman about it. Numerals, <laughs> yeah. If you think about it, the really iPhone kicked off at what? 3? 3. Yeah. It was iPhone and then it went iPhone 3G. Oh. So is it going to be 9 after X? No. Probably. But I mean, oh. Apple don't give a fuck. They're going to go back to. Probably going to do either 11 or X2. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. X. Well, I guess the X is, X is technically not supposed to be a part of the numeral no. family. It's, it's like, just its own it's like iPhone. Next generation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, they killed me. I like it, though. This shit just, it feel weird, man. It's kind of small, but I like the phone. Oh, close. Yeah, Might yeah. sell this bitch, though, if they flipping it for 2000 Yeah. Damn. Hmm. I'm cool with the A+. Plus. What else is going on, bro? Uh, let's see. White Louisiana team busted for burning down black church. <sighs> so, what happened? Let's see. They took him uh, to Burger King. Let's see. According to HotNewsHop.com, <laughs> A white teenager has been arrested in Richland Parish, Louisiana, in connection with the destruction of a predominantly black church in the neighborhood. Uh, the building burned down early last week, and eyewitnesses have identified the young man as a possible suspect based on accounts of events. Uh, let's see. A 15-year-old in question is now being accused of stealing a truck and using gasoline to torch the place. Of course. Wait, wait, he's 15? No, like... Stole the truck and used gasoline to torch the place. Man, y'all just letting white Yeah, but it's not funny, whatever, but... Man, y'all, y'all gotta relax. And there was a church shooting, Jay Carey said in the back. Oh, he's still awake? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, man. What's going on, man? Let's see, what else is going on? Um, they shot up that Walmart in Portland. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. Local they are Denver here. News. Yeah, and local Denver News, well, national news, really. Yeah. They shot up the Walmart. So what, what happened with that? Because I was trying to keep up and kind of lost track like you know to my understanding someone just walked in and lone white shooter yeah goes in and shoots three mexican people i'm pretty sure that's what it yep. so yeah. terrorism and, and, yeah. uh, i mean but again it's are they describing it as that dude he had like a stack of bibles in the crib i've been keeping up on this one a little wow bit. It, his story is weird as fuck bro man it's weird as fuck He's Let's down. talk about that, the, the, the lone white shooter thing. I think this is something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, I hate to get into conspiracies and shit, but Let's talk about it. There's too many, there's too many of these lone just distraught white dudes. Right. That Vegas shit don't make no sense. At all. Yeah, where? Nothing about it makes sense. The one person could cause that much chaos. Yeah. That's that's you deeper. Know, for what? Matter of fact, we, white on white, like white person killing white people. Like, right. Like, there's no sense behind that. What why? Shit gets deep, man. But we're gonna we're gonna go ahead right, and uh, yeah, yeah. let's go ahead and intro <laughs> Musa since he's about to just I'm, <laughs> I'm very since affairs, he's here. Bro, I'm here for current affairs Wait, too. Let's, fam. let's do one more. Let's do one more. All right, well, let's get one more. Let's see. There's an article that says why DJ Quick is one of the greatest of all time. Because the nigga's perm was flawless, no homo. <laughs> do we feel like he's one of the greatest of all time? <laughs> I mean, at what like though? From a turf aspect, set at what? He's one of the best producers. Ever, okay, I think I can get behind that. Rapper. He's a legend, no he's doubt. Not even top one hundred rappers. Have we forgiven uh, DJ Quick for disrespect? I think we gotta eventually get over that, Denver. <laughs> we have, we have to let that shit go at some point. <laughs> 30 years ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> Niggas that go to concert now, that, if you're 18, ago. you don't know what DJ Quick did to us. <laughs> man, come on, man. We got to let that shit ride. All right. Well, DJ Quick, if you're listening. Uh, you can come to Denver, yeah, bro. You can come, come smoke with us, You're man. safe. You're you good. got our word, man. Over here, at least. We try to put that gang shit aside now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let it go. <laughs> but if you do want to do your research, uh, what was the song? Like, Just Like Compton? Yeah. yeah. 
Denver. What a, man, shut your ass. <laughs> Look, <laughs> he, he mad again. Welcome, welcome we should have just let it ride stuff. after that. Now we done reignited Denver, this shit, man. We're going to show you it's not like Compton here. <laughs> but what's the question? Was he one of the greatest? Yeah. I guess it depends on which aspect you're looking at. Okay. Producers. Uh, he's producer? a good solid. You have solid. to mention him hits. up there with Battle Cat and all that. Yeah. hits. Yeah. Battle Cat, Dre. Yeah, you have to. But that's that's where he ends right there. Here's, here's some good news. Diddy changed his name to Love. And that's not good news at all. That's terrible news. Because I'm not calling no grown ass man Love. <laughs> that's, I don't like that news at all. Diddy needs to stop, man. He got a new album. All these dudes out. are going through midlife crises, bro. And I. That's when you start changing your name to Lovejoy and, and, and Sparkle, Sparkle, Cuz. <laughs> and he's going through a midlife crisis. Bless. All right, let's get into it. Yeah, all right, man. So we got another dope episode for you guys, a special guest in the building. Who do we have? Man, this man is legendary out here in Denver, bro. Real talk. We're going to let him tell it because y'all sleep on it. He could explain himself a little bit more than I can. But it's Musa in the building. Up, hey. What up? Pleasure to be here with y'all brothers. This is great. No doubt, bro. So for the people who don't know, let them know who you are and what you do. All right. My name is Musa Bailey. Uh, I'm from Denver, Colorado. I'm from New Jersey originally. One time, Jerry's my man in the building. Uh, I'm from Princeton, New Jersey originally. Uh, My my mom's from Denver. She went to East High School, and she was one of the first black women to go to Princeton University from from Colorado. Okay. So I was born in uh, Princeton University, or not Princeton University. I was born in Princeton. Uh, my father is from New Jersey, but my mom's from Denver. We moved back to Denver when I was about four, okay. and I grew up here. So I'm a Denver native. I've been here all my life. Um, but then I moved uh, back to New York for about 10 years. I lived in New York City for a while. Uh, got married, moved to London for a little bit. Um, that's my phone, man. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just giving you my backstory, just like who I am personally. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh but I'm back in Denver. I've been living here since uh, probably like 2005. Uh, I'm back on. I'm a DJ. I'm a art collector and curator. Um, I just owned a bar and a, a restaurant just recently. Cold Crush, rest in peace. We'll get into that. Definitely get into that. Cold um, Crush. I got a Airbnb jump off right now. I've this is ridiculous. You Curtis know, Park Curtis, Curtis Curtis Park Art House. Yeah. You know, like I'm just a businessman and an artist. I make uh, I make music. I make beats. Uh, producers, DJs, uh, MCs, get at me. I'm um, I'm looking at formate, formulating like a, not even like a label, but just like a, a conglomerate of yeah. yeah, there you go, of of Denver art and culture, uh, especially in this neighborhood because this is where I'm from, Five Points, right. Curtis Park. Like this, I know this like the back of my hand. So, uh, what else do I do? Uh, I'm a dad. Straight up, I'm a dad. That's a very important part of my life right now. And, uh, yeah, now let's talk about shit. Hell yeah. You do a lot of shit, man. Let's, let's I do a lot of things. The, uh, I do music, a lot of things. The music aspect. Um, um, definitely, I think, personally, one of the most slept on DJs as far as when you start mentioning the established DJs in the city. Yeah. I feel like your name has to come up. I've been DJ lining everybody. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I remember... Going so my dad used to throw parties in Park Hill in the Holly, mm. and Big John used to DJ those parties. Dang, to Big, John. Big John used to DJ those parties, and so I remember when I was a little little kid going to the to Holly and and my dad like collecting money and paying Big John and and like yeah. seeing like hip hop culture like really really at its like small small stages, and so I was like, man, that looks fun. Right, that looks fun, and then uh and then I met Little John who's another Denver legend. It's a white dude from Park Hill. And asked Big John about Little John. Uh, I forget Little John's last name. But it was a white dude from Park Hill. And uh, he had 1,200s in his house. And he was already nasty. And this was like 1980-whatever. And uh, I was over there playing basketball with the homies. And I was like, dude, what's going on in there? And I saw 1,200s for the first time. And I was like, oh, these are... These are dope, like, and and he proceeded to do like a battle routine in front of me with the back to life, the shit, the the fucking however do you want me had just came out, oh, mm. shit. Had, that shit had just dropped. That's like nineteen ninety or nineteen eighty nine, and it still and slaps. He, yeah, it yeah, slaps yeah. to this day. So he did a battle routine with that in front of me, and I was like, I got the chills on the back of my neck, bro. I was like, man, I don't, I think I want to do this shit. And so I went home and I was like, Dad, I, I want to. I think I want to get some turntables and shit. And he knew a DJ at the time who was selling some shit. 
Right. It's like a week later, I got turntables. I was 13. So it began. I was 13 when I had the turntables in my basement, and I was just like, oh, shit, it's on. I had a party like a week later. <laughs> I, I got turntables, a mixer, speakers, and a couple records for like $250 from this shit. guy. And that, that was it, bro. And from that point, uh, I just started DJing seriously. I was already nicer than most niggas when I was like 18. Oh, that's you shit, know what right I'm saying? Because I've been DJing. Like, that's what I was doing as a kid. You right, know what I'm right. saying? Like, like really like practicing and stuff because that's all I wanted to do. I wasn't really that into girls th- that yet at that point. I was just like, man, music, 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 music. And so from that, man, I just was able to move to New York and link up with Saul Williams, who is probably one of the most prolific poets i know a lot of people probably don't know this guy man but absolutely he's a big deal Mm -hmm. and uh at the time he was signed to rick rubin Mm -hmm. so he was i I met him in new york and he's like yo i need a dj i was like all right let's let's go and we did a show at um cbgb's gallery which is like it's not even there in new york it's like historic place in new york city and uh and the next day we flew to paris bro Shit. I was just living in New York, just DJing in yeah. spots, and then like that went from like, all right, we killed it that night. All right, now here's a plane ticket. Let's go be on French TV. We were on TV Damn. the next time. What age was this? Man, I was like 21, 22. Okay. This one I was living in New York. Yeah. And uh, so I met Saul, man, and I ended up producing like two or three tracks on his first album. Like I was in the studio with Rick Rubin and Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine yeah. and fucking the Chad, the drummer from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Like they, I, I got to see like the music industry, bro. Right in L.A., like in New York City, we're bouncing back and forth recording this dude's album. The album didn't do well commercially, but like it, I I learned the game of the music industry when I was like 24 years old, Damn. and I'm 43 now, and. Beyond you know, season. so yeah, it's just like I don't I don't tell people a lot of these stories because like you know it's 2017, bro. That shit was fucking a long time ago. But right. that's that's part of who I am it's now. And why why I why I, I moved the way I moved because I, I learned the, the the real deal music industry back when there still was one. Back mm-hmm. when there was like advances and studios right. and all that old school music industry stuff. Right. You know what I'm saying? So what was your favorite uh, memory of working with Saul Williams? Uh, that's a good question, dude. Uh, this dude shot me the this this dude showed me the world, man. I've been to Paris four times. I've been to Amsterdam five times performing. Like, like it's just the the traveling part of it. The fact that I was like so young and and my passport was just like bow 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 bow. Okay. You know what I'm saying? That I could see all these places that I wouldn't normally get a chance to see because I was a performer and an entertainer. You know what I'm saying? So there's not I can't think of like one particular moment Mm -hmm. but I just remember like uh, here's a good moment we played a festival in France with De La Soul was the headliner and I was like how could you forget that you know what I'm saying (laughs) I was like man this is crazy that's when you just done yeah 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 like super super bro this this was long this was like in the 90s and like De La Soul was a headliner and I got to meet them and and I got I mean, like I said, I smoke weed. Like in France, it's different. They don't they don't have weed like this. They have they got hash, bro. Like yeah. if you want to get high in Paris, you 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 got to know somebody for real to get weed. But everybody has hash. So I remember like just after the show, just meeting these French kids and just getting high as fuck. And I just couldn't just speak no French at all. <laughs> I just didn't speak anything, and we're just sitting. I'm just sitting there, just laughing and smoking with these kids, and I almost missed the plane. I almost missed the plane, like almost every show and everywhere we went, because I was the extra dude in the group. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was always trying to find weed. I was always like going to get sneakers right before, like an hour before, because you know what I'm saying? Like I was the extra dude. So just the whole experience of like traveling and being in a band. You know, I was traveling with, like five or six people, right. and Saul. And that shit was just amazing, man. It just taught me how to how to how to be part of a team. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You're also an avid, um, I want to say like cartoon, comic, sci-fi type. Man. I'm nerdy as fuck, bro. <laughs> nerd ass. I'm a nerd. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> but listen, the cool part is like. Like, nerds is winning the game right now. That's a big Nerds is killing the game right now, especially black nerds. Like, I don't know where it became, like, not not cool to be, like, into comic books or Mm -hmm. cartoons or whatever. But, like, bro, I grew up on comic books. Like, that was, like, my first little connection to art and creativity is, like, looking at X-Men 
comics and and looking at uh um you know just different versions of of cartoons and stuff and just being like man this is creative you know there's something cool about this but then it's like you start like the hood starts making you like feel embarrassed for liking shit like that you know what i'm saying and like the pressure of of each other we're like oh that ain't cool man that ain't cool but i never i never really succumb to that because it's like i I just know and that's what's cool about being a dj because like i could be like a nerd for music right. and Cats Under left me alone about that you yeah, know yeah. it wasn't like oh this nigga collects comic books you know you know it's like nah this dude is like the music nerd right. you know what I'm saying so but 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 uh, but comics and, and anime and all that Japanese shit bro I love that shit and I always I have for a really long time to the point now where that's I'm trying to make a project right. about my son and, and our life of, which is the assassin with son shit you mm-hmm. know that um that's, that's from that vein you know, that's, like, that's the kind of project I'm working on right now. That's yeah. dope. That's dope. So how do you feel about the art of DJing now in 2017? And just the, the evolution it's gone through. It's You know what's cool? It's back. The uh, the DMC champion this year is 12 years old. Yeah, that shit's crazy. Japanese kid. For a 12-year-old Japanese. Look him up, bro. Yeah. <laughs> and he killed it. And he killed it. With Funky Cold Medina, though. Yeah, like, yeah. His, his routine was like, the like old school hip hop songs. He used uh, the Pharaoh Monk shit to mm-hmm. get the fuck up, and he used Funky Cold Medina. That's that's music that there's he's not even connected to. Right. You know what I'm saying? But but he is because hip hop is eternal, and for him to be able to be as good as he is at 12 years old as a DJ, that gives me hope. You know, I know a lot of people are just like, man, it's corny and all these sucker DJs. Man, there's a lot of fake-ass DJs out here just that's, that's killing it, you know, making money and driving nice cars and all that shit. And, like, look, fucking bless. But what I what I see is the future. What I'm thinking about is the future. And for a 12-year-old kid to win the biggest DJ competition in the world, right. DJing is good right now. Mm. We're good because that means that young kids are back on the like fucking let's get nice. Right. Fuck this button pushing and being like, oh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm dope because I'm fucking jumping up and down or I, I play the loudest than anybody else, you know? Nah, man, are you dope? Right, right. Are right, you right. dope? And like, that's that's back. Mm. So, so I'm I feel, that, though. I feel positive what about, about hip hop. That's a different story, man. I don't, I can't. I'm a DJ, bro. I don't care about rappers that much. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I don't really care about like. I mean, I care about the other sides of hip hop, but the 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 way the music sounds now, the way it is now, it's not necessarily for me. Right. You know, and like I said, I'm 43, bro. Like I'm not, I'm not 18. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I can see how this appeals to young kids, yeah. 18 year olds, 19 year olds. Like if that age, you just want to turn up and get lit. I get it. So I don't disassociate myself from it because it's all still hip hop. Right. But at the same time, like that's not the music that I particularly want to DJ or play and but I don't have a problem with what it is because it's just things change man it's true you know I'm just I I see a lot of old dudes that just don't they don't adapt well man and they don't that that kind of puts you out the game because like if you're dissing new shit then you're not even paying attention to what you can learn from right right, right. you know what I'm saying like that that's not even like a, a a, a, a way to live as a wise person. <laughs> you yeah, know yeah. what I'm saying? You, do you dissing kids? <laughs> She's not nah, cool, bro. Man. You just dissing <laughs> young people. You're going to be like, oh, that's corny or that you don't do that or whatever. Like, I'm not I'm not a big... And you know what's cool? My dad never did that. Right. And that's why I'm in the game the way I am because my dad, as soon as I was like, dad, I like this hip-hop shit. I like, he's like, okay, cool. He wasn't... He could have been like, man, that's, that's for... You know, yeah, I don't yeah, like yeah. that or you shouldn't be into that. He was just like, you know what? If you like this... I like it too and I'm gonna try to like be your father and be into it right. even though it may not be for me right. that right. I mean a lot there's a lot to learn from what's going on right now with the music and young people and I like, think people should stop dissing it so much and just be like yo what can we learn from these guys what are they trying to tell us Straight up. you know yeah, I think what are, that everyone's on fucking drugs what does that <laughs> tell us right. what are they trying what to say what are they trying to say man <laughs> it's like everyone's leaning out every day that yeah. has to that's a, a cry for help right yeah. you know what I'm saying but I mean hip hop generation before that we sold all these little niggas of drugs man look we created so. a generation of crack babies fam yeah like you know the generation like if, if you sold crack in the 90s or, or, <laughs> or the 2000s even and you got anything to say about anything you need to shut your ass up man. <laughs> right because like you contributed to the to the to the problem you right. know 
I don't, I don't know, man. It's just it's a lot of drugs right now, man. They're doing heavy drugs. And so that changes the sound. I mean, you can think about, like, the 60s and acid and, like, psychedelic mm-hmm. music. When you're taking a lot of drugs, that changes your your personal perception of the universe. Right. Sound sounds different on lean and acid and weed and That's all these right. things. Yeah. So, like, if, if you look at the way even the music has slowed down, that's a reflection of the lean. Yeah, it seems and it's, it's, it's like now, 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 now when like, cats are in the studio, they want to lay back yeah. and it, it feels like slower or whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to in like the 80s and the 90s, hip hop was like, it's, it's, you know, because yeah, it's, it's cocaine and like, yeah, you know what I'm either. saying? Like, yeah, drugs, is, it's drugs are always a part of, of the way music sounds and moves. Yeah. The same way acid did in the 60s. Like, if you, you, you in the studio on acid, bro. You're you're on another dimension of <laughs> you're on another yeah. you're in another dimension. Yeah. That's why George Clinton did. That's why them fools really became hardcore drug addicts. Yeah. Because when you start doing crack and smoking a lot of cocaine and doing a lot of cocaine in the studio, bro, you become invincible. Mm. That every riff, everything you do sounds good as fuck. And you're just like you press record and then you go back and listen to that shit sober and you might have a fucking hit record on your hand, bro. Right. I promise you, George and them fucked up on all of them fucking See, that's why uh, 21 Savage rap Everything like a they did, they were high as fuck. <laughs> it's them Zans, bro. So how can we be like looking at these kids now and be like, oh, don't do drugs, man. What are y'all doing? Why are y'all yeah, doing all these part drugs? Of the creative process. Well, that's part of the process, man. Unfortunately, crazy. I wish there was a better way, but this music and drugs has been going hand in hand forever, man. Yeah, forever. But the good thing, I think that's kind of come from just the, the change in the hip-hop industry is the, the business aspect. You have a lot more independent artists. You have a lot more artists who are entrepreneurial. Uh, Isn't like, that the, the essence of hip-hop, though, man? Yeah. Mm. That, it, that's not even like going back. That's just what it is. If you can't do this by yourself, mm-hmm. what the fuck are you doing? Right. If you can't do it with your squad and your town and your people, then what are you doing? That is the epitome of hip hop that's exactly what New York City did mm. they did that shit by them motherfucking selves bro mm. with nothing with no help from the government no resources they just said you know what fuck this shit we're gonna change all this shit right now overnight they had a riot everybody had DJ equipment <laughs> and, and fucking the blackout is when everybody came up man yeah and everybody had DJ equipment and they said now we're independent that's, that's as hip hop as it gets the, the industry stole hip hop for a minute the music industry stole hip hop, but it's you can't. It's too powerful to to contain because once you say to someone, "Here goes a computer," now you can go make a whole entire album at your crib. Yeah. Literally, you get you and you get independent again. Right, 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 right. It's, it couldn't be more independent than it is right now. Bro. You, can you can distribute fucking yourself. make a song, put that shit on YouTube, and the whole fucking world can see it immediately. Instantly. Like right that's now. independent as fuck. Yeah. So like. A, it, the industry had hip hop for a minute because they had control over the distribution of music who could get it where, where you could get it now yeah. that's done cool. that's been done man so now we got the foundation we got the backstory of Musa we're talking about independence and uh, doing it yourself let's go ahead and get to it man tell the people about Cold Crush all right, so I'm just going to start from the beginning because this is a funny story. This is a cool, funny story. <laughs> this is a cool, true story. Okay. So, like, 2012, I'm out with my homie, Eric Cunningham, and who, who ends up, we'll get to, he ends up being the other main pillar of this. We're at um, 3014, which ironically is the Brian, the, Brian, uh, the building that Brian owns now. Yeah. So he owns this building that we met in. So this guy comes to 3014, me and Eric are sitting outside on the patio, and he's all loud and shit, he's got a fucking fur coat on or some bullshit, he had like a fur coat on or some shit, dog, and it was like October, it wasn't even that cold yet, you know what I'm saying, he's notorious for that, like wearing big ass coats when it ain't even that cold, but uh, yeah, just being out there, so anyway, he comes in, just being all loud and shit, instantly I'm just like, man, this guy's a fucking jerk. And uh, and I look at Eric. I was like, "Yeah, bro, whatever." But then he, that same night, he ends up just buying everybody drinks. You know, and then it's just like you, yeah, that's no, why you cool. can't just like yeah, just be like first impression is sometimes accurate, but not always. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But th- he ended up like just buying the whole bar drinks and just being a really nice guy. So him and Eric had become friends before I became friends, Brian. 
because uh, I hadn't even been around him as much as Eric had. And then finally he was like, yo, you should come talk to this dude, man. He like, he knows about you now. I've been telling him about you, you know, like he wants to maybe open a bar and whoop de boo all this shit. So I was like, all right, I'll talk to him. But like, fuck it, bro. Like, I, I don't, I've been talking to people about right. shit like this, you know, like a couple people had already came at me because, because of the DJ shit, bro. I've been throwing parties and doing shit forever. Right. So I've had this conversation before. Oh, I want to open a bar or whatever. I was like, all right, man, I wasn't even that excited about it. So then I met him one night uh, after a gig I had had that I didn't get paid for. I remember this vividly. Okay. Like somebody was supposed to have my money after the gig and they gave me a check. And I was like, oh, you got to fucking be kidding me. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, I told, like I work in cash and they knew that, but they gave me a check at the end of the night. I remember being really pissed off. And then Brian and Eric came and picked me up in Brian's Porsche. He used to have a Porsche at the time. And, uh, and, and he's like, man... Moose, what do you want to do? Let's like Eric was adamant. He's like, let's let's open this bar, bro. Let's get a bar. And I was like, man, fuck a bar, bro. I'm broke, man. These dudes pay me with a check tonight. <laughs> I was like, fuck a bar. I don't care about none of this shit. And Brian was like, man, what you need, bro? And he just blah, 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 just gave me like two G's real quick. And I was like, dude, all right, man. Like, I don't know why you're doing that. I need this money, so I'm gonna take it. <laughs> I need this two racks. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. I need this two racks, cause so I'm gonna take it. But what are you saying? He's like, man, let's fucking open a bar. Like, I've been talking to a lot of people. Like, Eric thinks you know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. Let's fucking make this happen. So after about two weeks, we started really talking about it. Yeah. Like, really doing it. And there was another girl who was helping us, Cassie. Yeah. yeah. Like, Brian, there was a, a really cool, beautiful, cool chick that was, like, right there with us. Like, being like, all right, what do we need? What do we need to do? Getting the liquor license done. I mean, it was a lot of work, bro. Yeah, yeah. It was. In the beginning, it just felt like a ton of work. Like, for nothing, really. It's like, this is in the future. And we're just, like, meeting every day. <laughs> we're like, man, like, when are we going to start making some money on right, this shit? Right, right. <laughs> it, it, it felt like it took forever, bro. But then um, it started to happen slowly but surely. Like, we, the paperwork was being filed and all this stuff started to happen. So we were driving around. Brian was picking me up, like, looking at spots. But both of us, me, him, and Eric, and sometimes Cassie. But we were, we were driving around all over the city looking at spots. We were in the Highlands. We were all over the place mm -hmm. looking at shit. And it was just, no, no, no. Everything just was whack, bro. It's like, didn't want to be over there. Not so much that I wanted to be on the east side consciously, yeah. but something told me that that's not my hood over there. Or, like, I don't know if I'll be comfortable opening a business over there. So after, like, seeing two places one day, we drove down here. And he's like, Moose, there's a couple places down here. Let's look at one. And then we saw the corner spot. Mm. And, bro, that, that, that place has been there forever yeah. since, like, the fucking 50s, yeah. probably even before that. And it's been businesses since the 50s. It was, like, a, a pharmacy, a, um, a fucking grocery store at one point. Mm -hmm. It had been turned up. And then it had been empty, for, vacant for, like, six years. Nobody was even thinking about that corner, bro. There was another, the Metal Arc was open, the Matchbox was open, and the Larimer Lounge were open, and though, and Joe's Liquors. Yeah. Those, those are kind of the only businesses on that block at the time. So we drive by the shit, and I was like, B, this is the spot. <coughs> this one, I felt the fucking chills on my neck. I was like, dude, this is the corner. This is the east side. I grew up down here. Yeah. I know everybody that lives down here. Mm -hmm. And so we just jumped on the building, and... From that point on, it was just like, all right, we got the spot now. Now we have a place. Before, we didn't have a location. It was just like this pipe dream because we were, like, doing all this work and shit, but we didn't still know. But as soon as we got that corner, bro, the whole thing changed. And then it was like overnight, it felt like it started to happen. Right. So that's the, how it started. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's, let's move on to another question, you know, because <laughs> I, like, like, I can't really trace back the whole yeah, yeah. thing of it. But that's that's how it started, man, of just like an idea. And I remember B had just moved here from L.A. and like cats were just like, oh, man, everyone was coming at him, you know, because yeah. when dudes have money and they're, like, they're fun, like you get a lot of people in your ear and, and like a lot of people had ideas for B. You know, they were like, yo, let's do this or let's let's get a concert and whatever you know but like the thing i'm most proud of is that we had the foresight to see that like those are temporary things a right. show that's one night of money man yeah it's one night yeah like a, a bar a restaurant that's every night man that's seven days a week just money 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 and i'm just i'm proud of us having that 
foresight because we could have did some other shit, yeah. you know, and like a couple of fucking dumbass concerts, you know what I'm saying, and spent a lot, the same amount of money we spent to open Cold Crush on like two concerts, Damn. and and we could have lost a lot of money, bro. But yeah. instead, like what was created was created, you know what I mean? So what would you say would be the brand of Cold Crush? What does Cold Crush represent to you? The uh, hip hop man, hip hop, like for real. If I just just boil it down, because what, what we decided to do was like really go hard with the music stuff. All right, so we we built the DJ booth on purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, like we could have just opened up a bar and just be like, all right, it's a bar. Yeah. We're gonna put a table over here for DJ booth every now and then or whatever. Nah, bro, we like we put a really good sound system in there mm-hmm. and we we built a DJ booth that was like an altar almost. You know, so. That's the that's the DJ side of me right. that I felt proud of is that man we're gonna make this shit like hot for like DJs and right? why and, and why for, Cold Crush why the name from the Cold Crush Brothers man the old okay. school hip hop man that's a good question a lot of people didn't really understand why it was called Cold Crush it's because Cold Crush Brothers and the, and it was actually Brian's brother who came up with the name I think because Eric and I didn't like it we were just like man us just sounds cold or you know we're like from Colorado dude's like man it just sounds like it's gonna be cold but he's like nah man it's like from the Cold Crush Brothers yeah. and then both of us was like oh okay alright <laughs> right, you know, it's fucking hip hop cool and so we we ran with the hip hop vibe so hard that 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 is the brand the brand is art which is graffiti and street art and all that stuff we did that hard the 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 music the DJ side the 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 playing new music breaking new music Mm -hmm. we did that hard Um, rappers in there MCs vocal you know it's it's the most hip hop shit I've probably ever seen in my life bro and I've been all over the world and I've just been able to take all of those things and put them together in one thing yeah that's the brand word so it definitely is a brand but all right. so we got the beginning and then in the middle you know, the people uh, that know the story know the story, but we ain't even got to get into all of that. But no, the be- middle's important. It became a culture, it, pretty much. Like it became quickly, more than quickly, a bar. Way, qu- way quicker than we thought it was. Because, right. like, again, when you provide something that people are connected to, they're going to come back. They're yeah. going to be drawn to it. So right. before we knew it, we were just in there playing Tribe Called Quest and Biggie and Nas and shit. And people were like, yo, we fucking love this. Yeah, yeah. This is great. Like, I can sit here and listen to Biggie and eat lunch <laughs> you know <what> I'm <laughs> or eat tacos or whatever. Like, there was nowhere in Denver that was, like, playing hip-hop, like, in the middle of the day. No. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? When you walk in, it's fucking mob deep on in the speakers and you got to make a decision right, right. if you want to sit down and eat lunch and listen to mob deep or do, are you excited as fuck because that's what's going on right now and before we knew it people were just excited about that they're like man like this is all hip-hop all the time right they're not in there really trying to be nothing else but that right and it uh kind of lost where the question was no was so we're just talking about how, how it built the culture because pretty much oh yeah the, the culture i like to side. call cold yeah. crush like the black cheers because like <laughs> yep everybody knows each other you know what i mean like, and, 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 it, and it's not because we came. knew each other before that it's cause so you here's another thing i want to give a lot of props push. to a lot of people to y'all to like jeremy pape and the dope game kids yep. like what what it, it it became like headquarters because of the way we tried to present it so yeah. it was just like all right look y'all want to come here and have y'all little rap meetings and y'all little group you know all right cool do that so before we knew it, all the cool kids were going to Cold Crush first. That's that's why it was successful. Right. It wasn't like oh we just had all these people overnight. Nah, the right people in Denver were like going there. Rue, right. you know what I'm saying? Shout Big up Miss Johnson, fucking uh, you know Johnny Denver, all like you know Alvin Sweat, Francois. All all of a sudden, all everyone that was dope that was part of hip hop right. in Denver was at the bar. Right, 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 right. When you when you have that kind of momentum, you can't really stop that because then you're going to get customers and people being like, "Who the fuck are all these good looking black people? And what, <laughs> why is everyone hanging out on, on this corner or doing right. whatever?" You know what I'm saying? Right, like right. that that drew so much attention to us that ultimately in the end it did backfire because we we can't maintain that energy in that small of a place. Word. All right, so that's a good part right there. We're going to take a quick little break, pay some bills, and we're going to get in to the now yeah. and what's really going on. Life is Dope Podcast. Be right back. Bitches. Hey. We got our man Moose. I'm still Moose. What's up, man? <laughs> hey. So he schooled us on the beginnings of Moose. Yeah, that was, that was part part one. Yeah, man. Crush. How it started. Big Again, big up to Brian Mathenge and Eric Cunningham 
and and my dudes who and uh, Jip. So we'll we'll add my man to this equation too. Jip the Hip is uh, yeah. my homeboy. I've been DJing with for a long time, and uh, instantly I brought him in because I just knew that it needed that energy. And so the, the pretty much the four of us really had just put our hearts into this place you know jip was djing three times a week sometimes I, you know before we even pulled in anyone else we were just there holding it down and it still worked so uh yeah part two <laughs> and so I, I think part two of, is success you know part one is just a dream you know part one is just trying to do something that you think is going to be cool or that you know people will come to or you think it's dope part two is success you know before we knew it it's a line out the door it's a hit yeah yeah, that's like a, really, it's a, it's a line out the door, and every night, and we every night, and we were just like, wait a minute, like how we were just trying to do something <clears throat> fun for us, yeah, you know, where we could just like be in there and just meet girls and hang out and just be cool and shit. But then it turned into like the club, mm, yeah. you know, quickly it turned into the club, and uh, so you know, then and but partly by our design, you know, we brought on promoters, we brought on Kevin Kane, we brought on Francois. And Alvin and 3D, we brought on K Tome, shout out to K Tome. Yeah. We brought on, um, you know, a, a DJs that probably a lot of people hadn't even heard of at yeah. that point, like Facts. fucking Toppy. You know, a lot of people knew Top Shelf, but when Top Shelf destroyed Clo- Cold Crush, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Every time, uh, Squizzy, people knew about him a little bit, mm-hmm. but af- after Cold Crush, this dude's a household name, yeah. Because be like, because it, it was cool, and for me, that's another thing I was the most proud of is that after we went from all right, it's just me and Jip and our homies DJing. We brought in other DJs that we didn't really even know that well. Yeah, right? yeah, you know, yeah. I met Squizzy Taylor for the first time in Cold Crush, setting up in my DJ booth. I'm yeah. like, man, who are you? Help me. He's like, man, I'm Squizzy Taylor. <laughs> He's like, I'm Squizzy Taylor, and I was like, bro, that's not your real name, is it? And he's like, nah, man, I'm Squizzy Taylor. I was like, I let it go. And, uh, <laughs> But, bro, he, he destroyed that place. Yeah. He brought so much vibe and energy and the whole thing. So now we're talking about not just me or Jip or, you know, our homies in there. We're talking about K-Tone and Scoozy Taylor. K-DJ. And K-DJ. Yeah. Oh, Simone. Man, dude. I never like, knew first Simone of all, until K-DJ, real quick, yeah. let me go back to that, dude. He's one of my favorite DJs, man, because this dude is not a joke. Yeah. And, and I, I think he's probably the most <laughs> underrated dude here. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And he's because, easily, like, man, top he is fucking whatever list. Ugh. Yeah. I've seen him DJ so many. So here's the thing. You get all these DJs together. Yep. Right? The best in the town. Yeah. Arguably. The best in the town. Dude, I'm nice. I promise you. Anybody wants it, they can come see me anytime they want. But the, the reality is, it's, it wasn't just about me. It was about K and about K-Tone and about Toppy and Squizzy and, you know, all these different DJs. Yeah. Who are watching each other DJ. Right. Bro, we we're in there over a little, little, doing this <laughs> on each other. I promise you, nobody. Uh, fuck Spider Tech. So here, here's oh, here's wow, the I other of our man. So Spider Tech and Wushu are part of my squad. I, mean, I got a yeah, squad yeah. of DJs called the Mean Team, mm-hmm. and it's me, Spider Tech, Wushu, Jip, and uh, and Spencer Foreman. And uh, bro, all of us have played in there so well and watched each other so much that we created a squad. Yeah, yeah. Because it was like, man, where'd you get that from? Oh, fuck the fuck. You know what I'm saying? It was constantly just like watching each other play and be like, yo, I'm better just by like watching you right yeah, now. Like exchanging you know? ideas. So it's like it became that like place for the DJs to get better. And that's why it exploded. Because we were in there testing records. We are in there doing shit that we probably couldn't do at other bars or other right. places. Yeah. And people are going nuts. And people are going nuts. So like we proved to each other how to be better and this crowd responded to that and that's why it went bananas when you get all those that energy of that many good DJs in there yeah you can't you can't really fuck with that and then on top of that you add the art side you know like I'm I'm rotating my friends we wrote we changed that mural 14 times yeah it was always some fire you know like and I can't even just big up every artist that's been in Cold Crush but it's that that is the other hip hop side of it. It was just like, all right, so we got the music shit locked down. That that's perfect. How do we add something else? And the something else was 
changing the art, changing the mural, like making it look like a new place right? every couple of weeks or every month or so, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. so with that then came the success of everything. And with that success comes problems. Let's just get right into it. Like when Goody was murdered, everything changed. Yeah. Long live Boss Goody, man. Long live Boss Goody. Rest in peace, 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 Boss Goody. He was one of the coolest people I've ever met, and he was just such a dope artist. Again, it was about the dope people being down there, right? Right. So he was one of the cool kids. Yeah. He was one of the cool kids, and a cool kid should never get murdered. You know, a cool kid is supposed to be a cool kid and like just stay a cool kid. He wasn't really about that fucking crazy shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. But when you um. When, when he got murdered, that's when the landlord decided this place is problematic. That's when the city really decided coal crash is a problem. Mm. That it, like Up until that point, we were getting I mean, thousands of police calls, complaints, <laughs> you know, fights, this, that, and the other. But at, up until then, you, I could feel the shift in my stomach, yeah. how things shifted after that. Right. You know? It was a. Uh, it sucked, man. It really sucked, and a lot of people got blamed for it. Like, uh, people wanted to blame everybody except for the dude that killed Goody. Yeah, you know, they wanted to blame me, bro. Like that shit was on me heavy for weeks. Right. People were like, "It's the DJ Musa guy." Mm. It, it, if he gets people get shot at shit, he does. Like people were blaming K Tone, fucking ridiculously. Right, that's crazy. That's fucking Everybody up, but man. the person that You know what I'm saying? Trip. Everybody except for like the person that actually did the shit was responsible. So ultimately though, they blamed Coal Crush. Right. They blamed the bar. They blamed us. They said that we're facilitating this type of situation, behavior, whatever. And so the city shuts us down, man. It's unprecedented what they did to us. They they used a um, a law from like the the 60s or 70s of the public nuisance context which says uh, it's from the 80s actually it's how they shut down crack houses in the wow. 80s it's, it's saying that I see you're a crack house um, I see people coming in and out of there buying crack doing uh, selling crack whatever we're going to shut you down and we own the building now though. Mm. Well, now that's when the city can take over so at that point the city could have literally took over Cold Crush, but that's not what ended up happening, thank God. But they used that as a precedent to shut us down. Right. right. And that, that was unheard of, really. I mean, people get shot and, at, all the time. People get hurt all the time. Movie at theaters bars and fight clubs. Like, fights everywhere, break out at everywhere. All over, it's all over downtown Denver, especially. Yeah. But those places never get shut down. Yeah. And so the, 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 we, were, we were closed for about two days, maybe, I think. Before the city realizes that's that was probably unfair, and uh, in respect to you know Albus Brooks and and the Rhino people who did come to our aid in that time when they said, "Hey, listen, uh, this isn't their fault." Yeah, you know the you know our li- liquor license was taken away by the the city of Denver as and and so there's collusion there on so many levels on like why right. You know, like who who's responsible for this? Like who who said that the best thing to ha- the best way to handle this is take away their liquor license? I don't know. And so, I, but all I know is two days later we're back in business. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's real. This is the Cinderella. Community story. was behind yeah. it. Everybody was pushing. Like we got we we Bring had a rally. We had a rally at the bar. Two hundred people showed up yeah. to open us back up. The news came. Fucking, you know, it, it was a beautiful thing to see. The community get behind us and say, "Hey, listen, this wasn't y'all's fault." Yeah, Goody's mom, had, to 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 this day, will say and not blame anything that happened to her son on Cold Crush. Yeah, things change after that, though, bro. And after that, the the neighborhood is changing at the same time. I guess That's that will lead us to part three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so do you feel that gentrification? Oh, and the, part three is gentrification. <laughs> and the, uh, the the transition of the residents in the community had a lot to do with the ultimate fate of Absolutely. Gold Rush. Absolutely, and it'd be it'd be silly for me not to to admit that. But the the the, the difficulty that I'm having right now is that. Weren't we a part of that change? Right, 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 right. Like Cold Crush kicked off that change. 
Like we were the most successful business down here before any of this stuff started happening. Consistently, we were the most successful business in this neighborhood. We had the most diverse group of patrons and DJs. Most and staff. definitely the most diverse. So there's white people standing in a line to come into Cold Crush. Right. Developers saw that. People saw that. I think we pushed the development of this neighborhood five years ahead of what it was supposed to be at. Because if we did not take that first gamble on the shady neighborhood, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. and had consistently every kind of person going into Cold Crush, they wouldn't have saw the potential to make other businesses crack down here. Right. And that's what we did, bro. We were cracking every night, and they saw that. And so now here comes the big guns. They're finally like, all right, Larimer's ready now. Yeah. This neighborhood's ready. Yeah. You know? They didn't... They, it was... It's not just the scary five, yeah, It wasn't scary anymore. Like, now yeah. you got, like, fucking five, six bus, party buses of white girls coming down <laughs> to Cold Crush. You no exaggeration. It, right. it, might, it might not be the scariest place anymore. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it's time to go. The market opens. A bunch of new stuff develops around us. And all of a sudden... We're like the little guy on the block is what it feels like, you know? Mm. It's like we still got the corner, but now we're dealing with other businesses who are going out of their way to put other businesses out of business. Mm. Right. Damn. That's what happened with Joe's Liquor. Joe's Liquor is the oldest business in this neighborhood. It's, been, it's the liquor store that the Korean guy owns on, um, on right there on 27th. Right. Or in between 27th and uh, 26th. And weren't they trying to, I think they were trying to say something with like the homeless people. A group of businesses band together to send, just like what they did to Cold Crush, man. We were a problem down there. We were a nuisance. So what they tried to do with the liquor store is put the same thing on his head. Say, Mm -hmm. hey, listen, you're a nuisance down here. If it weren't for you, there wouldn't be no homeless people down here. Exactly. You're in here. You're down here selling cheap liquor and Lucy's and all this shit to homeless people. And the reason why they won't leave this neighborhood is because of you. Wow. And it didn't work, bro. Again, this is the power of this neighborhood. And this is why I'm never leaving the East side because I've seen twice where people who aren't from down here, the gentrificate, the gentrification has tried to come down here and shut down businesses that are valuable to the Mm -hmm. community. Definitely. You know what I'm saying? That never works. That never works. It works maybe sometimes, but the thing is, it doesn't work if the community is involved. Community was involved at Cold Crush. The community was involved with Joe's Liquors. And so when they tried to do that, we came out and did the same thing. We had a fucking protest. People were down there with signs and shit, fucking taking pictures. And all of a sudden, a week later, they don't, their liquor license is back activated. Right, right. It's like they're retroactively having to back, backtrack. Because they're shutting down businesses that have lawyers. They don't think we have lawyers, fam. Mm-hmm. They don't think that we know what we're doing because we're people of color. Or, or they think it's gangster. Or they think it's a thug bar. Or, or, or he's selling, you know. These are, we're talking about family businesses, man. People yeah. that are smart. And we have lawyers. And we know what we're doing. And so, anyway. I was just... Uh, wasn't even sure I was going with that anymore, man. <laughs> but I'm gonna go ahead and spark my split. I'm yeah, man. So, oh. so, so part three, yeah, gentrification. Gentrification. We can go on about that forever. But that's pretty much in a it. nutshell, I don't man. Talk about it too much. Here's, here's the big monster just swallowed up the 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 um, little guys on the block, pretty yeah. much, and the people aren't having that. However, we have run into a situation where clo- Cold Crush is officially closed. Right. So the the closing. Is is the product of what I was just saying. Mm-hmm. That after Goody was killed, the landlord we didn't own the building, so we were in the in the, the agreement of signing another th- uh, mm-hmm. three to five year lease. Mm-hmm. Goody gets killed. Landlord says, "I don't know about that anymore." Yeah, he, he pumped the brakes on the whole process. We had already signed the lease right. and sent it to him. We're just waiting for him to sign it to get it back. Yeah, but he didn't sign it. And so for the last year and a half, we've been in there kind of month to months on some really weird energy. So finally, you know, our lease was up in July, of just, just the past July. Uh, we take him to court because he told us through emails and other, you know, this is all public record, so I can talk about this. He yeah, told right. us through emails and all these other things that we would have an extension from July for three months 
Then at the very last minute, he tried to change his mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's when we took him to court. And we were like, bro, you can't do that. We have employees. These people have families. You know what I'm saying? You can't just tell us one thing through emails and whatever. Yeah, we didn't have a written agreement, but right. we have proof that we're d- d- negotiating this. Yeah. The judge argued in our favor, said, you know what? You got to give these people the three months. And so it went from a, th- a three-year extension to three-month extension to cold Kush is now closed. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> like, damn, like, you know all this, but then when you really hear it, it's like, when you think fuck, about it, it's, it's like, shady, that, man, like, yeah, this, this is crazy. Listen, there, it, there's so much shade involved that, that I can't even really get into it. But yeah, the, yeah. the reality is, and I believe in my heart, that place was taken from us. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And I can, I mean, I've been drinking, I'm high, the whole shit, but like, that's, I walk around this neighborhood still. I still live down here, bro. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, my Airbnb, Curtis Park Art House, one time, is right up the street. <laughs> I walk through this neighborhood still, and I see the development, and I see what is happening down here, and we weren't part of that plan. Yeah. So we they had to find a way to get you up on it. You know, there. like, this is, this is cookie cutter. This is every day, fucking knock this shit out, build this shit fucking throw a brewery in there throw you know rich people with money being able to take over entire blocks yeah entire blocks bro not just like a little spot here like a little coal crush I'm talking about the entire block yeah like the, the money that's in this neighborhood now is is hard to swallow because it's it's just like alright well where was this 20 years ago yeah, right. when it was dangerous down here and Denver needed that exactly. you know what I'm saying when there was gangs down here and, and we needed restaurants and, and gro- it's still not even a good grocery store down here you, yeah. Know, bro? Yeah. you know what I'm saying but it's coming because the, the, the demand is going to be there for it and you can't have all these people living in fucking these high rises and shit and they can't go buy food That's true. so yeah. now they're going it's, to it's like and this is listen Denver's not even unique in this happening this happened in every major city in the world yeah. but I, I live here and yeah. I'm from here and so this is very personal to me and so the part four if I think we're on <laughs> is the future yeah Cold Crush is closed man and it breaks my heart it really does because I think about all the, the people I met through from that place the people I became friends with the, what, the, the DJ connection that I had like I have a, a brethren of DJs now yeah, yeah. they were right. all they really built a family you know the they built a real community the artist you know that like I, I curate and do art for real now because my friends came into that bar and they fucking showed out man yeah. they did the, some of the best murals I've ever seen in my life you know what I'm saying like like Thanks. like like quality quality shit from the town yeah yes. this is the town doing this it ain't we're not flying dudes in and this, that, and the other. No, this is people that I drink whiskey with and not fucking smoke weed with on a regular basis. Yeah. And and they're so good at what they do that they crush it. Side note, the good cop, bad cop mural. Yeah, that legendary. Was my favorite. That that put us in a little bit of hot water. Yeah. Uh, that was that on put the news us in hot and everything. Water. And that's when I think that's when the cops did stop like liking Cold Crush yeah. and wanted to protect us. And, and again, I can't say that unequivocally that like that mural alone was why things started getting weird but I could tell they didn't like that shit man. that was iconic though you know like that's one of the moments in Denver so, history so, yeah so we've been able to do use the, the the voice of that wall to talk about shit yeah like who else did that I'm still doing it right now with the soul piece alright so part four the future soul was the end like that was a really important piece a big up Scott LaFaber He's my friend, and he did three murals at Cold Crush. He did the good cop, bad cop mural. Mm-hmm. He did the very first one of the dude digging through the records. Yeah. And did that piece right there. Oh, That's wow. Easy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he did the very last mural. The idea was to just, like, black it out. Like, if the problem with the art in this neighborhood is that it feels like we're painting the gentrification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 and I have this argument with a lot of my art friends about because this is the neighborhood where this is Rhino. This is where we paint. This is where art is made, mm-hmm. right? That's what uh, they say. Perfect. And so everywhere you look, there's there's art everywhere. There's big murals and cool shit. But then the 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 irony of that is that this is one of the most unaffordable neighborhoods in Colorado, right? In this part of the country. Yeah. How do those two things coincide at the same time? You have an art district and art culture that's where art is made so that means that by artists 
assuming robots don't make art like right. you know developers don't make art artists make art so if this is where art is made why aren't there artists living down here yeah and nobody can answer that question not even my art friends who continue to paint yeah. on these buildings right. they, they, they're just like well I'm doing it because I should do it and we should do it because we can't let them have it completely but they've already taken it yeah yeah. They already have it. It's crazy because and, and we're like, painting. We continue to paint it. So yeah. going back to the blackout, the soul thing. Yeah, yeah. That's done. No more, no more nice paintings from Cold Crush. So you soul went lucky. up just to, just to kind of get you guys going that don't live in Denver. I don't know. Um, it was pretty much just a blacked out wall with the word soul in white letters. Soul period. And now it's slowly, or it was slowly blacking out. Like what was it? Every few days. It'll be gone by tomorrow yeah so yeah. that's pretty deep like yeah. the soul just of the soul leaving the neighborhood and yeah. again this is scott lefavor and myself really trying to because we we wanted to just paint like tupac fucking middle yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 and we were just coming up with concepts and ideas and we like man what if we just say fuck you and then we just erase fuck you after like a day and i was like no man like you can't can't be that blatant, but right. finally we came up with the idea of just like soul. That Cold Crush was the soul of this neighborhood, man. It provided a place for everybody to go. Not yeah. everyone, everywhere is like that. Yeah, you know, like soul means that's universal, right? Yeah, that means it don't matter who you are. Like if you got that, then you can come in. A lot of these places, they 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 don't have soul. Screen for mm-hmm. that. That's not what their prerequisite is of what you get to come in. Money is yeah. why you come in. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Not soul, like. We 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 served fucking homeless people, gangbangers. We didn't like if you had it in you, like yeah. you could come in here. And everybody got along. Everybody. That was was weird, man. Like I remember the first time I ever went to Cold Crush. It was like a Thursday or some shit. Yeah. And I was just amazed by the fact because you know, granted, like when you hear East Side, like people like, oh shit. Like even when you're from the East Side, it's like, oh shit. Like, like, east Side, like, East Side, everywhere. Day. Yeah. So east Side. I go all in day. and it's like me and my guys. And then it's like all the cool kids, like you say. And then it's like regular Joe Schmoes that just wandered in. Then you got like some homeless cats that came in, <laughs> kicking it with the Crips. But we all vibing. Like everybody's just listening it's, to it's Wu Tang shit, just vibing out. Like that. I've, I promise you, I've been all over the world. I've never really seen homeless people being able to be embraced into a place. Yeah, just come in and as kick well it. as we did. Buy them a drink you know, or something. Like we just, these people are around us every day. We can't just walk over them. We can't just act like they don't exist. We employed the homeless people in our neighborhood. We yeah. fed the homeless people in our neighborhood. We did clothes drives for the homeless people in our neighborhood because these people are here. Yeah. You can't just look over them. And that that's, that's the, again, that's the evil of the gentrification. They're trying to act like these people aren't here yeah. or that they're not, like, relevant or whatever. And so they're just sweeping them off the streets or just pushing them out of sight. And that, that's, not, that's not what's up, man. And it's crazy because they're spending something. all this money to keep what looks like soul or what looks like you it's know the, art, the coolness yeah, listen, the culture the they're paying they, they, they sh- want to take advantage of this is of the culture but they don't this want, is want the culture under my they, don't want, they the want the culture yeah. but they don't want the people that's exactly what you just said they want to keep the art okay but they don't want us to, they want us to be down here yeah that's not going to work anymore and so that's why we blacked out the wall it's like now you got to know that you don't get the art no more yeah right? Like you, you don't even know how much of a service we were providing publicly to that community by painting. People would just come by and take pictures of the mirror. They were beautiful, bro. Yeah. They were they were flawless. They were done by professionals. They were done by people who make a living doing this shit. And now you don't get that anymore. Yeah. If we can't be here in business and you don't like our business, I mean, we dude, I've seen emails and letters from from people that you wouldn't imagine the most racist shit, yeah. the most fucking horrible, the, the deplorable fucking get these fuckers out of here type of shit. Like, if you don't want us here, then we're taking the culture too. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. You don't just, you don't, if you don't want us to see us, our bodies, and guess what? We're taking everything. And that includes that wall and the art. Rest in peace to the Cold Crush wall because yeah. I don't know what's going to happen now. So, <laughs> so that leads into my, my, my question, my final question. Well, not final question, but I guess the conclusion of this saga right here. What's next? Because Cold Crush is not just an establishment. Right, you know, now it's in. So the brand it's a is solid. We can yeah. go on the stock market right now. Bro. Yeah. Like, we're good, <laughs> Brian. Hey, just because I know people got their heads down, Tessa, all, all the staff. Shout out to Tessa. Yeah. Uh, I, again, I don't want to forget nobody, but just everybody that has contributed to Cold Crush, you have made it a commodity. 
you've made it a brand. You've made it something that people are going to remember. People want to buy merchandise and things from. That's a rare thing as a business because a lot of people have restaurants or or or, or bars or clubs, but it, like, do they do they affect the cultural integrity of a town? Right. Do they affect the the spiritual integrity of a town? And like, Holcrest did that. Right. No. Do we try to do? <laughs> it's real, man. All right. Do we try to do we try uh, to recreate now. it? All right. So the future. So the future is yeah. we create the fuck out of that. Okay. Mm. Okay. We create the fuck out of that. That is a, a commodity, fam. Yeah. Like we have shown that hip hop is still powerful. Right. That black people are powerful. That that uh, that that art and culture are powerful, powerful things. Right. But a lot of the development and a lot of the the new businesses in this neighborhood they're not looking at those things as the centerpiece of what they're doing they're like all right i want to just open a restaurant or i want to open up a place to sell beer if if the the core of what you're doing is i want to help the community that i live in you know i want to i want to support the homeless people in this area i want to support the kids in this area right. then you can create any kind of business that you want right so the next step is all kinds of businesses. Yeah. You know, not just a bar, not just a restaurant, but fucking car wash, fam. If you put a vibe at a car wash, you're going to get more businesses. That's than right. Anybody. Right. That's, that's real. Right. That's real. If you inject a real vibe yeah. at a car wash, you know what I'm saying? There's a spot on Colfax, bro, that sells coffee, but they got girls in bikinis selling coffee. Yeah. Right. Where's that? <laughs> Chick a latte, fam. I'm telling you, it's a real deal. Mm -hmm. It's the, the it, marketing. <laughs> it's everything. It's the vibe. It's marketing the vibe. is everything. If yeah. you inject a little bit of sexiness or a little bit of vibe into anything you'll make more money than the same person selling the same thing right. and that's why Cold Crush worked is because we injected the sexy hip hop shit into a bar Yeah, and it worked no one thought that that would work you know no one was just like yo just do straight hip hop every night yeah. all the time all day long it's true. and it worked it worked it be on. So I'm not going to say rest in peace, Cold Crush. No, Cold because Crash it's like the vibe there. is there. I'll say so long live Cold one more thing Crash. for the future, and I just want to say this publicly to like anyone who knows me or that wants to open up a business or that fucks with me or that fucks with Cold Crush. Like Denver is a really important place, and and I just think that uh, we're at the point now. Where if we start pulling resources together, that's why I appreciate y'all. Oh, no doubt. On the show. Straight you know up. what I'm saying? My man is like, I appreciate you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All that. Producer oh, Julie. Oh, like, weird handshake. Yeah, like, right. like, you know. Just people like Eastside Jewy and like all the people that I know that from Cold Crush. It, it makes it so there's the potential now to do anything we want. Cold Crush changed the town. So if there was, what if there was like three more of those places, you know? Mm. What if there was like a Cold Crush, you know, laundry mat and a yeah. Cold Crush, you know what I'm saying? It's like the brand is not Cold Crush, the brand is us. Right. Mm. The brand is black people, the brand is hip hop, the brand is uh, people of color, the brand is fucking white folks that are chill, you know? Like the chill is the brand. And so if you inject that into anything, it'll be successful. And I'm just publicly saying, let's get to work making Denver fucking dope because we got cool things to go do. Yes. I got you, bro. I got you. Shit, I'm going to ask my question because that answered it. But we're not going to say the end. We're going to say to be continued because the saga is to be continued. Bro, I got a couple For things real. coming up. Real quick, let me yeah, plug my last few yeah. things. <laughs> Plug, plug. <laughs> I'm about to make a, a, a short film with my son. That's a, if people have been seeing the Assassin with Son hashtag. Yeah, yeah. That's what that's about. Like, I'm studying this samurai shit. I'm studying Japanese philosophy and ninjas. And because my son loves it, and we dress up like ninjas and have a fucking ball. So that's really happening. Uh, so look for that. Um, I got some projects that I'm working on. Like, I think Welton Street is a very important part of this new equation. No doubt. So I'm challenging people to like, if you know, or someone that owns a business on Welton or is just doing something in the five points to come talk to me and let's really push for five points right now because I think uh, Rhino's done. This neighborhood is, is finished, but the five points is still the essence of black and brown 
Harlem, 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 Harlem of the West. Right. And I think we still have ancestors and energy in that neighborhood that will work in our favor if we decide to be business people and entrepreneurs. Um, my Airbnb is cracking. Please go check, <laughs> check out. <laughs> Please go check out Curtis Park Art House. I'm selling art out of there. I got a really nice place. If you're traveling, it's safe. It's comfortable. Um, and uh, my mean team is about to jump off. Big up Tech and Wushu and Jip and uh, Spencer. Uh, and um, yeah, shout out to my son. Where, where, where? Glenn, we're going to do things, buddy. Trust. And as far as uh, social media, how can people oh, yeah. follow you I'm and connect with Musa you? I'm Bailey on Facebook, DJ Musa Worldwide on Instagram. I don't really fuck with Twitter. Um, it's a waste of my time. <laughs> uh, what else? Yeah, my Instagram is popping and my, my Facebook is popping, so you can always check me on those things. Word. Well, man, shit. That was Thank heavy. you for being patient that with me, guys. Like, no, that was man. We needed, we needed all of that. Talk thing. And I, honestly, I needed to get that off my chest because... This has been a really difficult time in my life yeah. because to watch something you've done be successful have to end, like nobody wants that. You know, yeah. you think you think when it works, it's gonna last forever. Yeah. But the the truth is in knowing what to take from it when it ends. Yeah. And what I take from this is that there's so much more that we can do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's it's definitely thousands sad. Of like fifty billion more things <laughs> that we can do that are cool to make money in this town. So one time for the east side, one time for Denver. DJ Musa, put a rat skin in that back. Well, man, y'all, let's make hey, some noise. Hey, clap it up one time. Hey. Good shit, man. Life is Dope Podcast. I'm Graffiti. And I'm Davey. We out. Skirt.